Right. Uh, I'm pressing go live. Ah. <laughs> Hello, we are live. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome. welcome. Welcome to Festival Fresco's uh, 2021 Composer Workshop. Um, I'm Natasha, one of the founders and uh, co-directors of Festival Fresco, and I'm also a composer. So today we're going to talk through a couple of pieces by two of our associate composers, Adam West and Megan Tarpey. Uh, we've also got some of our lovely performers with us today as well, Lizzie Elliott and Ellis Thompson, to talk through these pieces. Um, so I'm just going to go around for some quick introductions. Um, Adam, do you want to go first? Um, hi, yeah, I'm Adam West. Uh, I went to the University of Birmingham and majored in composition, both instrumental and electroacoustic. Um, I'm now currently living in London, near Wimbledon, uh, working as an audio editor for TV. Uh, I'm also an associate composer with the Festival Fresco. They're very kind to let me come and unleash some of my weirdness on them, although this piece is uh, quite not weird. So uh, I hope you all enjoy playing it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Lizzie, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Lizzie. I'm a cellist. I, I studied at the Royal Academy of Music in London for my master's degree. And I currently live in Liverpool in the Northwest. Um, so I've been really enjoying being one of the Fresco musicians. And, and we played Adam's piece. So looking forward to hearing the recording of that. Thank you. And uh, Ellis. Oh, I think. Yeah, um, I'm Ellis May... and also oh, no. um, was part of the RNCM in Manchester. Oh, my, I mean, <laughs> um, I was, yeah, I, I live in Manchester basically and I'm hopefully will not be cut off from my phone signal uh, here today. So <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> That's great, thank you. And um, in a short while, we'll also be joined by our other composer, Megan. Um, so at the end, after we've discussed both of the pieces, there'll be an opportunity for us to answer questions from the audience. Um, so if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat um, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, they don't have to be technical questions if you're not a musician, don't worry at all. Um, just anything you're curious about to do with composition and we'd love to answer them. So um, let's get started. First of all, I'm going to play a video of Adam's piece, Melody in F minor. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Adam. Um, that was really lovely. Um, so that was recorded a couple of weekends ago in Manchester, along with our other concerts. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we've now also been joined by our other composer, Megan. Um, so we have a full house now for today's stream. Um, so first of all, I'd like to invite Adam. Could you give us a little bit of background on your piece? Yes. Um, well, firstly, obviously, I just want to say thanks to all the guys who who had, had played it. So, um, yeah, it sounded really nice. And it's always lovely as a composer just to have stuff played by real musicians rather than listening to Sibelius bashing away at your music um, and ruining it. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so this piece, obviously, it's sort of like a, a piano trio. Um, and I wanted to compose something. I was actually asked for 2020 by Natasha and, and the festival uh, to compose something. So I started thinking about this in about for 2020 for the festival then, but obviously with everything that went, went down, uh, we didn't end up doing a live festival and there wasn't really much time for um, composed music. So we, uh, we did a lot of recorded stuff, which was good too. Um, so this piece started then, um, and I wanted to write something that was quite harmonic and like quite melodic. Um, and motive driven, um, sort of more traditional, I suppose, because um, at university we did do a lot of weirdness, didn't we, Natasha? And uh, I think I think I explored the depth of my weirdness with a, a cello piece that I wrote for Lizzie actually in 2019. So uh, I felt like it was time to do something uh, a bit different. So this piece came um, and I sort of started the process with that melody actually, with the, the fifth leap, the, um, at the beginning. Yeah, and I just started thinking how I could sort of knock it together with, uh, using sort of a more traditional harmonic structure. So it starts in F minor, um, goes to the dominant briefly, and then modulates completely to the um, third uh, a, a flat minor. Um, I didn't want to write it in A flat minor diminished, so I, I didn't do that. Um, and then it goes back to F minor, basically. So I, I thought it was a nice sort of way to explore a traditional structure um, to a piece. Uh, yeah, and as you can see, it sort of uses the the four instruments are sort of in a conversation. Um, I use quite a lot of doublings, so um, like the piano and the violin um, play the, the melody together a few times. Uh, the cello and the viola do work together as a block quite a lot, uh, sort of keeping that sort of motivic impetus to the whole piece um, throughout. And yeah, so uh, I think that's probably, I don't know how deep you want to go into like where it starts to modulate and how it does that, does that process. But I thought maybe it'd be better if we sort of throw it out to some of the musicians um, to talk about, because I know when you played it, Lizzie uh, and Ellis, you both had um, some questions about uh, articulations and stuff like that uh, and, and clefts. So maybe if we could talk briefly about those points a bit more and um, that'd be quite interesting. Yeah. So if we start with Lizzie, maybe. Yeah, so uh, fantastic. I, I enjoyed playing your piece, Adam. I thought that it had a really beautiful melody and as a cellist, I'm always partial to a nice tune. Um, so that was great. Um, in terms of articulation, there was a few things that we thought were slightly unclear. Um, but after I spoke to you, it became a lot, a lot clearer. So I think basically that there was too many instructions sometimes. So yeah. like a slur and a dot and a tenuto mark. And then we were slightly confused as to exactly what you wanted. So if, say if you weren't there, as a composer to clarify, it might be more difficult for someone to, to imagine what you had intended. Um, so in that way, it was useful to have you there. And I think possibly just a slur with the, the, the dot would have been fine or just a muto would have been mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of times when we slightly changed a couple some things we didn't actually ask your permission sorry um <laughs> in the in the main part where we have the da, 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 yeah. we took out the slur completely and we did it all separate bows 
because it was a lot easier to stay together, especially yes. in that echoey acoustic, it was a bit difficult to hear. And um, we felt that it gave a more of a rhythmic feel, especially as there were string crossings. So in general for string players, I think if you have string crossings and you want separate notes in one bow, mm -hmm. it might not come across as clearly at that tempo as, as you like it to. So separate bows will make possibly worked slightly better. We could still do a longer stroke with the separate bows. I don't know what you thought, Alice. I think maybe it's frozen. I think, yeah, it's frozen, frozen and drinking. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's um that's all very interesting stuff. And obviously, as I was saying just before we went live, actually, um, to all of you, I think that this is one of the yeah, the yes, yeah, I agree. It was um perhaps just occasionally um is he back. Well, I think oh, oh no, um, we've we've gonna... lost a trooper. Unfortunately, <laughs> he'll um, come back in a moment, I'm sure. <laughs> hopefully he'll rejoin us momentarily. But as I was about to say, I mean, this is one of the things that obviously is a great thing about having a piece played. Um, I mean, I'm not a string player personally. Um, I'm, a, I'm a keyboard player um, and a singer, really. So I'm writing for strings or I'm writing for woodwind. Um, you know, and the amount of times I've written for woodwind and they just said, you know, where do I breathe? you know, and stuff like that. So it's just all of these sort of things, which is why getting it played by people is so good because you can just then annotate and, and fix your score. Um, and yeah, so that's fantastic. Thanks for that, Lizzie. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about any, any other thing else that was like slightly odd or difficult or you thought oh, worked really um, well, maybe? Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, we spoke about the clefts, didn't we? I forgot to yeah. say. So um, I think keeping it simple with the clefts for cellists and viola players, and I presume it would also be the same if you were writing for bassoon, for example, or anyone who swaps between, mm -hmm. um, is to keep it more simple. So for treble clef, for cello, if you go below the A string, so the A below middle C, we get a bit confused. <laughs> So it's better to stick to, to tenor clef or okay. bass clef. And again, with tenor clef, if you go below the D string, so onto the G or the C string, we get a bit confused again. So it's better to stick to, to bass clef then. The bass clef, yeah. case. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe it's the same string slip, but yeah, <laughs> I think in general. Um, but I think that the doubling worked well. I liked the parts when the cello and the viola were playing together. Um, I just think that because the key was very tricky a lot of flats at one point it went to seven yeah, sorry flats no it's fine it's just if we're playing in unison and then with the piano intonation is always going to be very difficult um we tried our best but yeah, yeah. Well, i think i mean it did come across very well um even in the um in the double bit but as you say you know um that will become quite difficult um that was cool uh anything else that you thought well, well any particular parts in the cello part I don't, I don't know if you have the score there or not but um yeah I do. yeah any parts in the cello part that you like particularly um when looking at this oh, i liked when i had the um, whenever i have low notes and i like going on to the open the open c string for example from c i thought that was nice and um it worked well. I liked the the different timbre of the the piano mixed with the viola tune, and then the cello being very very low down. Yeah. So that that worked that worked well. I liked playing that, and um, I liked the the ending as well. I thought the different textures were were really interesting, especially as everyone else kind of had a longer note and the cello had a shorter note. Mm. Uh, I thought yeah. that worked. I remember we discussed about that because. You weren't sure if it was it was right, but I, it was an odd choice. I agree, um, but it was something that I wanted. Sort of, you became the weight, like sort of like the bump, whilst everyone else yeah. kind of held on, and it sort of like faded away. Um, yeah, maybe that, that was probably my electroacoustic brain working a little bit there. I was thinking, <laughs> like, um, 
you're the you're the hammer and then the rest of it's all the ethereal stuff that like <laughs> goes away into the distance yeah um, interesting and that actually brings me to an interesting thing which is something i i very much when i compose like to play with the extreme ranges of of instruments so obviously with the cello it's so beautiful right down there as you say with the open c string and like having that playing right down there um and then as you say like the piano and the viola maybe an octave or so above um just yeah really interesting textures you can get and then i did do something really mean to ls if he's always oh, back um <laughs> at, oh i forget where it is yeah so i i take the viola quite high in its range i'm not sure how exactly if that's right at the top of its range if ellis is back he might be able to answer that question was that before d uh just before e oh and probably before d as well yeah and, and d yes yes there uh, where it goes up to the top e e flat i think it's um i think it's great to i mean obviously um I'm not a string player, but I think it's um, I think it's really great as composers to um, oh we've lost Alice again um, to explore kind of wider ranges of the instrument because I'm also a clarinetist and when I've played contemporary music, um, especially by kind of like student composers, a lot of the time there's a tendency to play it quite safe and to sort of stick in the middle of the range. So when I played contemporary music, I'd always get quite excited when a composer would actually use the full range of the instrument because you can show off a little bit more um, what you can do. Yeah, 100%. Um, I know Ellis did say, actually, when he was looking at that, he said to me, it might squawk squawk a bit, I think was the word he used. Um, <laughs> and I was a bit like, but that was kind of what I was going for. I wanted that maybe slightly strangled sound right there at the top of its, its range to sort of really punctuate the... Um, you know, the sort of the culmination of that rising um, motif, which actually is the moment where it fully modulates to A flat minor, if anyone's interested. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's cool. Um, anything else, Tasha, do you have any questions on, a, on the piece or? Um, I don't know about questions, but I've got, um... Just something that I really liked was um, the way that you use texture in various parts of the piece. So especially when the piano comes in, in, I'm trying to find the bar, oh yeah, figure A, um, that's quite a nice sort of adjust because you have this quite dark, intense string sound and then the piano just sort of looms in with this arpeggio yeah. and that's and a really actually, nice texture. And again, yeah. later when the piano becomes more soloistic, there's a really lovely moment as well. Yeah, and actually that's quite an interesting moment maybe maybe to talk about because I know you guys found that bit quite difficult to get together, I think. I think because obviously you see in the video actually Radu's like looking at, at you guys. Um, and I don't know whether that is something that, would that always be difficult or is that just a matter of like just practicing a lot like that one, one moment or is that something that's particularly difficult to do? Um, I think it would work require quite a lot of rehearsal and maybe people that are used to playing together regularly I suppose it's worth saying that we all kind of came together yeah. to rehearse your piece and we don't usually play together as an ensemble so um, anything that's difficult in terms of getting it together will always be easier with people who are used to playing with each other I think possibly um, a piano cue would have been useful there in the string parts. Yes, no, yeah, definitely. I can see that. Um, again, I, I knocked this together. I was thinking about it for a long time, but it came together all quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. But again, yeah, piano cue. I did actually think to myself when I was watching you guys play it, I should have put a cue in your part. There was um, one moment, I think, where the piano has the long solo and we're all uh, rest, having rests. And um, none of us really knew when it was finishing the rest. Also, because there was a repeat and it was quite rubato, like we weren't sure. So um, luckily, Vanessa was page turning and she she knew. <laughs> so she, she told us, um, revealing yeah, all our secrets. You. But <laughs> you, been good. Oh, is Ellis back? Um, it looks like we have Ellis back. So um, would you like to? Give us some of your thoughts on what it was like to play Adam's piece. Yes, sorry about the connection, everyone. Um, I'll try and uh, get some in before it goes again. 
Yeah, um, so I, I heard quite a bit of Lizzie's stuff from the beginning. So, yeah, the thing about articulation, often a bit less is more, and you can write, you know, sim, sim if the same thing carries on, and then a, a new thing looks more uh, obvious, if you like, if it changes then. And, the whole, yeah, the whole thing about kind of connecting things within a bow is a nice effect, but when it's that rhythmic driving thing, um, as you've written, I think, as, as you wanted in this piece, it's kind of, it's harder to make that sound clear. So we, um, sorry if we've already discussed this, but <laughs> we sort of decided to kind of keep things separate bows, sort of near the heel and everything. Um, so it's just a bit, bit easy to, to stay uh, together as a group and, and to hear the percussiveness. So, um, yeah, the the other things I, I can remember were the, there is that particularly high bit just before letter D, I think it is. Yeah. Um, that's uh, <laughs> it's doable. I mean, it's uh, it's it's slightly un unusually high. Uh, it's certainly not the highest it will go, but it's uh, um, I think the combination of it being a slightly tricky key and, and just generally being a, a viola player who's not not very good at reading high stuff because <laughs> uh, the, the the parts are parts are always uh, pretty simple <laughs> in many things. Um, it's yeah, but it yeah, so it, it was a nice effect because it felt like every. Every instrument had a, had a good stab at the um, the melody and its its own moments. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it felt like a good. Uh, uh, and, and I, I like this section from letter C as well. When again the, the the melody changed a little bit there, the violin drops out briefly and uh, a slightly different texture. Yeah, um, I mean that was something I definitely wanted to do. I was like, I want to give the viola more of a, a front seat um, role because I do feel like you guys often just get you know. Yeah. The, third, the third and the root and you know you just play a lot and I, I wanted to give you something Bugging, exciting. Yeah. and that moment at sea actually is quite exciting isn't it where it just comes out and you've got the little more than yeah. well on the yeah. um, on the c flat um yeah so i'm i'm, I'm hoping it, it gave you something to uh to at least enjoy for a moment <laughs> it did yeah yeah it was certainly uh certainly felt like a a, a good contribution bit itself self-serving <laughs> ego of course but um and i think again i'm sorry if you've mentioned do tell me if you've already spoken about it, but just kind of at the end as well there was a, a slightly odd thing about the um the, the very last notes not all on our parts i remember they weren't quite the same length um yeah. so we sort of had to work out whether that was correct or whether we'd <laughs> we'd just all miscounted um but actually yeah uh, perhaps just occasionally if there is something a bit unusual like that or there's a an entry after a long break maybe like a, a little cue in the part or something would again just um perhaps uh, avoid the need for people to to ask too many annoying questions <laughs> during, yeah. during the rehearsal because of course it, it, when you see the score it's all it's obvious but uh yeah just perhaps there's something else to to, to speed up a, a limited rehearsal time uh session uh, just to give as many um hints as possible however however obvious you might think <laughs> they sound. Yeah, exactly and i think that is yeah. the key thing to, to to say here is um obviously you know as composers we often have very clear ideas in here of exactly what we want but we only have a limited range of articulations and space on the page and sometimes i think as i've done here in a few moments um you overdo it quite easily and quite quite quickly you put too many instructions into a small space and that does become quite difficult for musicians to read um, or and interpret so um, that's something that I definitely will take away from you guys playing the piece and talking to me like this about it which is really nice um, and again you know I mean it's been oh you know three years since we had our or more than three years since we had our final pieces <clears throat> played at, at university and they did a similar process like this with us as well but it's one of those ongoing sort of um ongoing conversations that needs to be had with with musicians and every time I come to compose something in a different style or something slightly different um, I feel like that process needs to sort of begin again um, because finding the sweet spot finding the articulations that give you the effect that's in your head um, sometimes is just a process you need to talk to a player and just be like what does this sound like can you just do that or well, maybe if I ask you to do this and if I add this symbol does that help or does that make it more complicated um so it's quite nice I know that me and Lizzie had a bit of this on that piece that I did in 2019 as well because that was very sort of out there and I was doing lots of harmonics and overbowing and stuff like that so we actually um you were very kind and you played it didn't you Lizzie and you did me some videos and things like that and we sort of workshopped it before the fact which was really a, a nice process to go through um 
but yeah, so I think we're running out of time on, on this one, are we, Tash? Uh, we need to talk about... Indeed, yeah. Sports. Um, so Indeed. thank you very much. I just wanted that. to add... Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Um, I just wanted to add a quick note on what you were saying just then about um, kind of expressing yourself as a composer on the page and um, something that I find quite useful. It sounds like a very silly thing to say, but it's just words, obviously not filling the page with text, but sometimes if you're struggling to express what you want in terms of musical notation and articulation, just a couple of words um, in text format above the stave can also be really useful, I think, as a way of just saying, I want this to be, I don't know, detached or intense or something like that. And then the players can see the sort of feeling that you're going for. Yeah, um, so I, I use that technique um, for the piano, thing. for the piano solo um, at mm -hmm. F, I sort of put a little um, sort of bit of text, you know, saying spreads are optional, uh, spread chords if you need to, because I'm basically saying to the pianist, I completely acknowledge that these are huge chords. Um, and it's sort of, again, you're going from very extremes in the bass up to quite high in the treble. So um, yeah, as you say, using words. And the other thing I'm thinking coming out of this conversation and having had you guys play it and stuff is I probably would also do some sort of like program note um, and some, maybe a key sort of like with, I, you know, sort of explaining particular moments and like why maybe I've made those decisions and things like that. So people can just quickly, as you say, when I'm not there, they can get the full feel of like what I'm, what I'm trying to do. Um, so that's really useful. Anyway, I'll stop now, and um, we need to talk about Megan's. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm Indeed. afraid I'm going to have to to leave you. Please. Sorry, but uh, thanks again, and uh, enjoy the rest of it. Sorry. <laughs> Thank off. you very much, Alice. See you. All right, bye. -bye. See you. Okay, so thank you everyone and thank you Adam. Um, so now we're moving on to Megan's piece, which is a piece called Sunrise Sunset and it's for two pianos or forehand piano. Um, so first of all, Megan, would you like to just introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. So I, I'm Megan. Um, I finished my master's in composition in Manchester. Um, God, it seems like ages because of the pandemic now, but yeah, it was at the end of 2020 and then it got extended and things. So yeah, I, I'm from Wigan and I've just been te teaching piano at the minute, uh, but I'm still trying to write as much as I can. And yeah, um, do you want me to go into any more detail? Okay. <laughs> Um, that's grand, thank you. I think we'll play your piece um, okay. now. We've got a sort of realisation of it um, and then we'll talk more. That was really great. Thank you, Megan. Um, so would you like to start off by telling us a bit about your piece? Oh, cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just, just for a start as well, I just want to say thank you for putting that together. So um, last minute, I know it would have been a bit of a, a bit of a mad rush. So thank you for still, you know, workshopping it and things. And Adam as well, I really enjoyed your piece. I think I've got a lot to learn off your texture use, definitely. <laughs> but yeah, um, this piece is Sunrise and Sunset. So um, the original idea actually came about when, when we first went into lockdown. Um, I have this sort of, sort of notepad where I scribble down ideas and I thought of um, doing that at the time just to 
Um, every day felt like Groundhog Day, didn't it? Sort of reliving the same thing over and over again. So I thought I'm going to try and make um, a notepad of loads of ideas. So when I do get some motivation, I can, you know, go for it. And that way I can look at my notepad and things. And I remember um, being on my phone for ages and I was looking at all the world clocks and I was thinking, oh, what's everyone else doing around the world? Everyone else is sort of in different lockdowns and things and um, in a similar situation. And I remember um, seeing, you know, over here, the sun was rising and on the other side of the world in Australia, um, it, it was setting. And I was thinking, oh, I wonder what that would sound like as, as a piece. It might sound really strange, but I usually take a concept like that or like um, a series of art uh, or um, dance dance people, you know, performing and things. And I imagine how it would sound, how it would translate to music. Um, so that that's where it sort of came from. I mean, obviously the, the piece isn't finished yet. There is still um, work to do with it. Um, but that's where it came from. And the, the end goal is for um, both players to have the same music, but one is playing it backwards. So one person is the sunrise and the other person is the, the sunset. Um, so yeah, they're essentially playing um, the same thing. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit of background on it anyway. Um, I, I like to think of um, color as well when, when I'm writing. Um, so I, I was imagining like different tones of oranges and, and reds. Um, and sort of thinking, oh, how would those colours sound like? Um, I don't know if um, you know, uh, there's an artwork by Kandinsky um, that is like this bright orange um, sun and it's like projected sort of like the lights projecting on this um, little sailboat. And that, that's what I was thinking of. Um, I'm not sure if I can show it in, in this Zoom call, but um, that's sort of what I had in mind at the time. Um, but yeah, that, that's just a little bit of a, a background. I think it's called Red Sun and Ship. Um, if, if okay. I'll just look it up it now, in. see if I can share. Yeah, it. Um, it's quite a nice. It's quite um, minimalist. There's not there's not um, lots going on in it, but um, that's how I imagine those sun tones to sound like. Um, quite a lot of staccato and things like that, um, but also quite quite a warm piece as well. That's what I was trying to get across. Okay, I think I've got the um, artwork while I load that up. Um, yeah, that was really great. Thank you. Um, really interesting to hear the concept behind it as well in, in detail. I think we can really, you can really hear that, especially the sort of um, cyclical nature yeah. of the piece. Um, yeah, I found definitely, especially when you've got these um, kind of, oh, they're not quite octaves, are they? But these um, sort of little stabs, the dum, dum them kind of syncopated yeah. stabs that you can they really stick out so that for a listener is a really good sort of anchor point and you can hear them being passed between the two parts which I think that's really great and you can very clearly because I think they overlap the most in the middle section don't they so you can hear them starting higher up on the sort of top piano part and then you can hear them pass to the bottom piano part and that's when the cycle kind of passes its center point and the parts yeah. swap over sunrise becomes sunset that yeah sort of loop i think that's really great yeah i think sometimes um, it can be so quite the... dangerous when you're repeating oh sorry yeah it can be it can be quite no, no, carry on. when you're repeating sort of certain sections as a composer because you don't want people people to be like oh yawning and things because they they expect what's happening so i i was trying really hard to sort of make things really different even though they've sort of got the same music that, that was, I think, the main problem that I faced with it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was, I think it's it's worked really well and, and I can't wait to hear kind of what it becomes in the end. Um, so I think I just wanted to talk a little bit about the instrumentation. So it's for um, forehand piano, isn't it? Um, yeah. Did you come across, I'd just like to know really how you approach writing for, um, for that. So just for anyone who's not sure, that basically means it's too people playing on the same piano. Um, so it, if you're listening, it it might sound like it's just one superhuman pianist, but actually it's, uh, yeah, it's two players. I think that <laughs> comes with its own unique challenges. Um. Yeah, it did. I, I realized uh, because there's obviously only one of, one of me. So when I was trying to um, play some of my ideas at the piano, I'd write them down. And then when I'd go back to it, I'd be like, oh no, those hands are overlapping. And, you know, and I'd had to somehow, you know, move them 
but still get the same idea across, the same feeling that I wanted. Um, but I usually, what, what, I, what I did was I, I sort of took it apart. So I, I just focused on one line um, and then switched it to see what it would sound like backwards. I rewrote it backwards on some manuscripts and played it. And if it sounded okay, I'd stick with it. But then I would just sort of adapt it in a way that it would still fit hands together. But it, it was quite difficult, yeah. So the hands, um, I still think in the, the uh, file that I sent you sometimes get quite dangerously um, close to each other. Um, but yeah, <laughs> something to work on. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think um, that's where as well, kind of, uh, once it gets played, that'll be a really kind of great point to work on with with some real life pianists. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But no, I think I think you've done a really good job at um, putting the parts together. Um, does anybody else have any sort of comments, questions for Megan? Thoughts on this piece? Um, no, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a really nice little piece and that's um, it's very interesting and actually now you've said about the fact that it's cyclical and uh, you know it sort of starts at the end and the beginning and works past each other that's really interesting and you can actually really see that happening on the page as well as like hear it so um that's really cool uh, and i and i know exactly what you were saying earlier about um not like as you say is a in a way as a composer you think it's quite a dangerous idea isn't it or the same material yeah played twice but you know introverted or something and, and, and we as composers we're always we always feel like we have to have a new idea don't we, we always feel like you know it has to be something brand new otherwise you say people will go to sleep mm -hmm. um and that's something that i fought a lot with, with my pieces you know i actually exposed that melody like twice before it even slightly changes and then it's very similar again and it's something that you have to have that that courage kind of just to go like i'm going to do this i'm just going to do it again and you know what? I'm just going to do it again because it's nice. Um, and that's great. And I think it's a um, really, really cool idea. Um, do you often, you say you often work with concepts for composition. So um, is this is sort of cycling call and stuff like that often part of your process? Like what other things do you use as part of your process? Um, it's not part of everyone. I think um, it, it is mainly a concept based thing, what I, what I write to. Um, Sometimes it will be, I, I do quite a lot of film stuff. I like writing for that. Um, or even paintings, uh, like the miniatures that I wrote, uh, they, were, they were for some um, Japanese artwork. I just think it really helps me like visualize. I like looking at things and thinking, oh, what would that sound like? Like, um, it may sound daft, like what would that water bottle over there sound like? But yeah, it, it sort of doesn't extend that far. But yeah, like just looking at things and thinking how would, how could that be translated into sound, um, even though it doesn't make a sound necessarily? But yeah, um, I enjoy it. I think it's nice to follow movement as well quite a lot of the time. Yeah, so like dances and things, um, or yeah, maybe I could have incorporated that into the sun a little bit more because the sun moves quite slowly. Because um, that's what I was thinking about when extending this piece that I'm looking at now. Uh, what is the next step for it? Because it's essentially just one piece of music that's flipped backwards for the other player. So how could that be built upon um, as a concept is the next step, I think. Okay, that's that's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, and, and interestingly, I think I think that's really cool that you, you, you look at things and you think about how they sound. Um, because in my and Natasha's um, experience sort of doing electroacoustic, we, we almost do exactly that don't we? we 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 often like you know you, you look Absolutely. at something you go, how does it sound when i hit this thing and then you you record it and then you deconstruct that sound and you kind of get inside of it um and you you sort of yeah you do all that kind of things so that's what you're doing obviously but sort of more with instrumental composition which actually is a very yes. interesting idea and something that i perhaps haven't interestingly thought about doing in my instrumental side of things um I often work with motifs um, and melodies and stuff like that um, as a basis, or as was sort of with the more um, contemporary style of composition we were doing um, at university, uh, sort of harmonic concepts. So my, my final piece, I, I built that all around a melody, and then I took all of the intervals and I verticalized that into chords 
um, across the the ensemble and stuff like that. So um, sort of concepts, but I think it's really cool your idea of yeah, like what does the sun sound like when it's coming yeah. up and going down? Like it's just really nice um, balance yeah. to it. Thank you. <laughs> and I think I've actually found the painting so what I'll do is I'll just share my screen and pop that up I hope it's the right one <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, that's can the you one see that? can anyone see that is that the one yeah so yeah um, yeah I think you can yeah you can see that's a really nice painting um the way the light kind of reflects on the little boat so that you're saying that's kind of part of the idea you were trying to capture is the light coming from the sun yeah that. sort of that color that like vibrance and the warmness I know there's quite a lot going on the boat so I think sometimes I, when I was looking at it I was thinking maybe the focus should be on the boat but I was like no I like the color <laughs> so I tend to I tend to focus more on color than anything um with this piece um so yeah um the sort of geometric type of boat uh, went on the back burner a little bit I think <laughs> Yeah, no, that's um, that's really great. I do like um, yeah pieces that use paintings. I wrote one myself a few years ago, um, based on a painting in um, when I was studying in France, based on a painting in the one of the galleries in Montpellier, and that was really interesting to kind of go into the piece of art and and yeah, like you say, think about what would this what would this sound like? How would I represent this in music? Um, I think there are lots of yeah, lots of different methods we can use as composers to kind of get inspiration. And I love hearing about them from different people. I'm going to uh, come out of that. Um, so I think, yeah, really great piece. It was really brilliant to hear it. Um, I think from a kind of, yeah, like a notation perspective, it's looking at the score now. It's all very clear, nicely presented. Obviously, we've talked about how important that is. Um, so that's really great as well. And well, it's currently it's only four pages, isn't it? So in terms of page turns, you'd be able to just spread it out on a piano and you wouldn't even need to worry about that, which is also good to know. Um, yeah, uh, Lizzie, do you have any thoughts on this? I know I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but just to bring you in if you'd like to offer anything. No, I really liked it. I really like the concept that it's got um, color or painting or something behind it as a musician sometimes really useful to have that as a reference to know, I don't know, it, it might not have the same ideas that you had, but it has something kind of to tangible to, to look at or to think about while you're playing. I like to think about colour or a particular image in mind while I'm performing. So that that's quite useful, I think, and, and really nice. And I, I, I liked that it was really little in short. I think that worked really well because it's kind of, um, you really were in, like captivated for the whole piece and it, it didn't feel like repetitive. Um, oh, that's really good. <laughs> that was the main goal. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it just felt really nice in, it, in its own little piece and maybe it would be in, an interesting idea to have a few sh short movements together in like a suite or something. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah rather yeah. than elongating it, I think it's nice in its little package that it's in. <laughs> yeah, I might develop it that way now. Give me an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. I thought it was really. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think talking about development, um, do you kind of have ideas as to where you'd like to see this piece go as it develops? Um, I think if, if anything, I was thinking of what, well, from when you guys before were talking about, uh, being a bit more experimental with range and things, I was thinking of, um, in that respect, thinking how experimental was I in that piece? But I feel like if I went any more like experimental, I, I don't know whether it would work. Um, I don't want it to, I, I don't want it to be like, oh, she's putting that in just for the sake of it, just for the sake of trying to fit in like a modern box. Do you, do you know what I mean? So um, I haven't really got any um, ideas on developing it. Like I was thinking of Elon getting it, but I kind of like the idea of having a couple of separate uh, pieces maybe. Um, Cause that, well, that was obviously like a Kandinsky um, 
artwork that I was looking at, maybe having a look at his other artwork and seeing, you know, has he done any others of different sort of images of sunsets so that I could have a look at maybe different colours, um, the sort of same sort of concept, but representing different colours maybe, uh, that could be a route to go down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, sounds that sounds fantastic. Yeah, I can't wait to hear what, what else you come up with. Um, and then yeah hopefully down the line we'll get we'll get a performance of this in there I think that would be really really great um, yeah hopefully <laughs> musicians as well um, so now thank you so much Megan it was really brilliant to discuss your piece and thank you Adam and Lizzie for your thoughts on it as well um, now we're at the time for questions and we've got a singular question currently in the chat um, which is what do we mean when we refer to the texture of music? Um, so I guess I'll sort of start off by saying sort of, for me, texture is kind of, it's how the different instruments work together and then what that sounds like. I don't know, I find it's quite a tricky one to um, define, even though I, I always say in my bios and things that I use texture a lot. Um, and yes, I'm struggling to explain it, but, um, yeah, I think it's kind of how all of the different kind of um, elements and sounds work together in the overall um, sort of, I was going to say image, but it's a sound, you know, image of a sound um, kind of comes across. Um, does anybody else have anything to, any thoughts to add to that? What's texture to you? Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say I, it's something quite tangible, maybe. Like if you think about it, if you had a soft, something soft, like um, a soft piece of fabric, uh, something metal, something rough, like, you know, like sensory toys, those kind of things. Uh, if you think about like the, the sound of the piano is quite um, percussive, I'd say, but then you could put the pedal on and then it would be more soft and smooth and the, the sound of the cello it maybe it's quite soft, but it can also be metallic, or you can have the wood, and uh, that would be quite a hard sound. So it's all of those things laid on top of each other and what that kind of uh, creates in terms of also a, a tangibility, maybe the, the aud audible quality of, of a texture of an object, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is I often think and this is very cheesy, um, but I often just think of texture of music just like food, you know, uh, you know, each individual in instrument has its own colour and texture inherent within it. As you say, the piano is very percussive. The cello is very warm and sort of like, again, we use words like warm. We use colour as well. We say, you know, it's dark or it's light you know and stuff like that those sort of color differences um and, and, and other people may even describe things as orange or blue you know it's like people have lots of different ways of uh, explaining what texture might be but um for me when you're talking about texture in a piece of music which uses more than one instrument um it's like you know a cake you know you've got your egg you've got your milk and you've got your flour and that each of the instruments are sort of adding their different color their different texture um and mood to a whole that creates the texture of the music. So um, in my piece, when I'm using the viola and the cello to do those sort of very sort of like short percussive, like they're down there, they're kind of, they're dark, they're broody, they're quite hard, um, hard sounds. But then I've got the viola, uh, violin on top doing the very legato, like, and you know, and you sort of got these, what I'm doing there is I'm offsetting those two textures to create an overall texture, um, if that makes any sense to anyone. But that's how I sort of conceive of it um, in my mind. Maybe Megan has some, had some thoughts on how she conceives of it. Yeah, I kind of like that. I think it works because I, I was trying to compare it to how I think of texture and I, I, I sort of think of it in layers, like how many layers does this piece of music have and what, what do they all do? What, what tones and uh, tones of sound do, do they give off? Um, 
yeah I like I like the analogy of um, a cake and things and the different ingredients I think, I think that explains it really well Yeah, I think that was probably my GCSE music teacher or something. You know, it's, <laughs> it's that amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, as, as me teaching um, sort of a lot of young kids piano, I might use that in my lessons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, don't, you don't even have to give me a credit. It's fine. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you. I hope that um, answers the question. And um, that's about all we've got time for today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, I'd like to just um, plug a little bit more of the festival uh, while we're here. So if you stay tuned um, at half past, we have another concert coming up. Uh, the concert's called Let's Be Happy. It has some really great music in it, uh, including one of my favourite pieces that we've played in the festival, which is a little klezmer tune called Let's Be Happy, which is where the title of the concert uh, comes from. And that's for clarinet and strings. And it is really a lot of fun. Um, so tune in for that. We also have two vocal concerts um, on this evening. We have a concert uh, of German leader, so German art songs, um, which is based on the theme, The Great Outdoors, and we have an opera gala. So uh, tune in if you'd like to hear those. And if you'd like to hear more from our uh, composers in the concert that um, premiered just before this earlier today, we've got one of Megan's pieces, um, Force of Nature for piano. Uh, one of mine was um, earlier was last night in last night's concert um, and you can hear Adam's music as well it's linked on our website if you go to festivalfresco.com click on artists and composers there are links to listen to more of Adam's work as well so um, yeah thank you very much everyone thanks uh, audience for watching and yeah I hope to see you soon thanks guys thank you thank you bye yeah bye bye